may be seated. I want to ask if you would to, um, to follow along in a Bible, if you don't have a Bible. Um, you've got a cell phone, and they've got some amazing apps. You can just look for the Bible app. If you don't own a Bible, we want to give you a Bible. And so back at our Welcome Center, we have some Bibles back there, nice leather-bound Bibles. Uh, if you don't have one, stop by and pick one up at our Welcome Center. We believe in the Word of God. Amen, Whitechapel? We believe in the Word of God, and we stand upon the Word of God. And if you don't have God's written Word preserved for us, we want to encourage you to pick one up. If you go to the very back of your Bible, you'll find the book of Revelation. It's in the very, very back. But if you go, what I say, to the left of Revelation, just a few books, you'll find 1 Peter. And we're going to be looking in 1 Peter this morning. But before we get to 1 Peter, I just want to read to you an account of the resurrection that we've gathered here today to celebrate. It comes from Matthew chapter 27. And in Matthew 27, this is what we find at the end of that. And then we'll read through the end of there. But I want you to turn to 1 Peter and just hang on there while I read these few verses. In Matthew 27, verse 32, it says, As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene called Simon, and they forced him to carry the cross They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. There they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall, but after tasting it, he refused to drink. When they had crucified him, listen to this, when they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And sitting down, they kept watch over him. Above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. The two robbers were crucified with Jesus. One on his right and one on his left. Those who had passed by, they hurled their insults at them. And they said, You who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. Skipping down to verse 45, this is what it says. From the sixth hour until the ninth hour, darkness came over all the land. About the ninth hour, Jesus cried in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, hey, he's calling down Elijah. Immediately, one of them ran over and got a sponge, filled it with wine vinegar and put it on a stick and offered it to Jesus to drink. The rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus cried out again in a loud voice, listen to the power in the scriptures here. When Jesus cried out again with a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. That's the moment that Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the King of the Kings, gave his life for you. And listen to the scripture. And at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and rocks split. And listen to the power when Jesus died. The tomb, we sang about it. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many who had died were raised to life. This is the moment that Jesus defeated sin on the earth. He came to give of himself for you. And on this Sunday, we celebrate the very next chapter, Matthew chapter 28 where we read about Mary Magdalene going down to the tomb because she wanted to anoint his body. And when she got there, the stone had been rolled away and there was no one on the inside. We read about Matthew chapter 27 where Jesus gave up his life. We read in the very next chapter about Jesus defeating death and how they came, Mary Magdalene came to realize that this was Jesus Christ who was speaking to her. And then Jesus commissioned the very first evangelist, which was a woman, by the way, and said, go tell about the resurrection. Go tell that I gave my life. And then we celebrate what Jesus did. But here's my question. What happened in the in-between time? When I, get to G- when I get to heaven, I have a lot of questions I want to ask God. A lot of questions that I want to ask God. But there's one question that I want to be at the very, very, very front of all of my questions. And some things have perplexed me. But I want to know what happened on Saturday. We read in Matthew 27 about Friday. We read in the very next chapter in Matthew 28 of what happened on Sunday. 
But what happened on Saturday? It's not in the scriptures. Can you imagine, just with, for a moment this morning with me, what it was like to be one of Jesus' disciples? When Jesus encountered them, he said, follow me, and they did it. The power in his words was astounding. He just said to the disciples, come, and they went for some three years, and he told them of the things that was to come, the scriptures tell us. They lived through Friday, seeing the man that they gave their life for die on a cross, and he told them it was going to happen. They didn't understand it completely, though. Then they get to Sunday, and they're living in the confused state of all that happened on Friday. But what happened on Saturday? We see all throughout the Scripture, or all throughout the Gospels. We know about Good Friday, where we have the crucifixion and we have His burial. And then on Easter Saturday, we know about the resurrection. We've gathered here to celebrate it today. But on Easter Saturday, that in-between time, this is what the Scripture has for us. Absolutely nothing. It's quiet. It's silent. Now listen, if I were Jesus, and I've given him this advice before. (laughs) If I were Jesus, I would be taking a victory lap in this moment, right? What did God do? He wanted to be able to spend time with his creation. And he had it in the Garden of Eden. And then the enemy comes along. And he introduces sin into the world. The flesh gave way to sin. And Jesus lost, Christ lost that. He was separated because sin separated us from God. And so from that moment in Genesis chapter 3, God began to put in place in every second that there ever was, from Genesis chapter 3 up until Jesus arrived on the earth, God was putting into motion the plan to come in the flesh to give himself so that he could have relationship with mankind now and it would be uninterrupted so that we would be able to experience his presence. And here on Good Friday in Matthew chapter 27, we read that it actually happened. He defeated sin and he doesn't take a victory lap. When I win... I win. And I don't let you forget it. You want to play Monopoly? I'm going to win. Well, because I'm the banker, of course, right? But I love playing games. I love all kinds of games. But I love to win. And when I win, I don't let you forget that I won. Now, when you win, it's a different story. But when I win... You remember that I won. And on Saturday, when sin was defeated, the earth, the actual earth itself, gave testimony to Jesus defeating sin. And God is quiet. He's quiet. I want you to think back with me over this past year been a crazy year. I remember in March of last year, whenever we had, well, we had known about coronavirus for just a little bit of time, we had started to see some of the effects of coronavirus, but nobody really knew. Even the scientists didn't have a lot of answers for us. I was pastoring in Crystal River at the time, and then everyone starts thinking or talking about the world shutting down. Shutting down? What is the world shutting down? We have never lived through anything. None of us have ever lived through anything like that. And so then they start saying, okay, we're not going to be able to meet outside. We're all going to be quarantined in our homes. All of us quarantined in our homes. Well, just in a few weeks was Easter Sunday coming up. I thought, well, it's easy for us as a church, right? We're going to be able to get together for Easter Sunday to celebrate just like we are today. No. We had to stay home. And as a pastor, you live, I I call it the Christmas Easter sandwich. You live for that time frame, right? 
And you look forward to having Easter celebration where we celebrate that Jesus defeated sin and then defeated the consequences of sin, which was death. And therein lies our hope. We didn't get to gather last year together. And then it went on for weeks and weeks. And some of us are just now getting back to a little bit of normal, whatever that is. Our world has been turned completely upside down in these last 13 or 14 months. We've all lived through all of that. It seems as if we as a world are living in this, what I call, Easter Saturday. It's not a lot going on. Not a lot of noise, if you will. Everything is just kind of on a standstill. And it's like, I'm not sure what tomorrow is going to look. I'm not sure what we're going to be able to do with your job. Some of you have still not returned to job. Some of you are still working from home. Or some of you have got some modification of a work schedule. And some of you are still not getting together with family. We're living in a world that seems as if it has been completely turned upside down. And for a lot of us, we're living in what we would describe as a world with no hope. You know, for the disciples... On that Easter Saturday, I think that they too were living in a world with no hope. I mean, just think about it. The man who said, follow me, and they did for some three years, died on the cross. The earth shook. The rocks were torn into. The skies were blackened. The earth itself testified that Jesus was the Messiah. The veil of the temple was torn in two. And then you get to Saturday, and it's quiet. I imagine the, the disciples were beginning to question themselves. What have we given ourselves to for these last three years? And now we get to this day, and the God of the universe who spoke the world into existence is now completely quiet? Imagine the disciples were wondering, what's going on, and is this really true? They were living in a moment where there was no hope. In a place where they felt like everything had been completely lost. For some of you that have gathered here this morning, that might be the world that you're living in right now as well. You might be living in that time where you feel like, yes, I had a relationship with God. I know that God spoke to me. And I began this journey with Him as my Savior, with Him as, as my Messiah. But right now, I just feel like I'm living in that in-between time when God is completely silent and I don't see a lot of hope. Yes, I know that Jesus is coming back for me. And yes, I'll know there will be a glorious return. But right now, it just seems like there's a whole bunch of quiet. You're living in a world just like the disciples were living in. But you know what did not change? Hope. The same hope that was on Friday when Jesus was crucified. The same hope when Jesus began, his dead body began to breathe again. And he defeated death is the same hope that was very much alive on Easter Saturday when everything was quiet. The same hope that you experienced with Jesus Christ becoming your Lord and Savior is the same hope that is alive and operational in your life today. And maybe you have not begun that journey with Christ. And you are living in a world with no hope. I'm here to tell you today that the only hope that we have is in the resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. The government is not our hope. The health experts of our day is not our hope. Congress passing laws is not our hope. Our only hope is in the resurrected body of Jesus Christ. And if you are looking to anything else, then I say to you this morning that our only hope can be discovered in the resurrection of Jesus. 
And in this moment where the disciples, as we're thinking about this Easter Saturday, in this moment of the disciples living in this Easter Saturday, they chose to not live the victorious life that God had in store for them. They got to experience, as Jesus' Jesus' resurrected body appeared to them, they got to experience Jesus on on that third day after he arose. They got to do that. But yet on Saturday, they weren't living in the victory that comes from hope. And so there was one guy, if you were to read in, in, in the Gospels, there was one guy who actually, as soon as he got to the tomb, he didn't stop at the door, the stone had been rolled away, he didn't stop at the door, but he ran right on into the tomb looking for what was going on. Mary Magdalene had come back and said, his body is not here. I don't know what's going on. We're not going to be able to go and, we're not going to be able to go and anoint his body with the spices. We're not going to be able to go through the rituals that we usually go through. You've got to come and you've got to look. When Peter got to the tomb, he ran right inside to look for Jesus Christ. And imagine the dismay when he got inside and there he found what Mary Magdalene had said. Nope, he's not there. Peter actually wrote some words concerning this day. We find them in 1 Peter chapter 1. And so I want to ask if you would to follow along with me here in 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll begin reading in in, uh, verse number 3. Peter's writing here uh, to some Christians who've really been scattered. For whatever reason, they've been scattered. And Peter's purpose is to actually encourage the believers, reminding them of the power that comes in resurrection. And in chapter 1, verse 3 of 1 Peter, this is what Peter writes, who ran into the empty tomb. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls." Concerning this salvation, the prophets who you spoke of the grace that was to come to you searched intently and with the greatest care, trying to find out the time and circumstances to which the Spirit of Christ in them was pointing when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. It was revealed to them that they were not serving themselves but you when they spoke the things that have now been told to you by these things who have by those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven even angels look long to look into these things. So what is happening in this passage of scripture? Peter who was at that first Easter Sunday is writing to some believers in Jesus Christ to encourage them and to lift up their faith. And what Peter is saying here is a reminder to a bunch of people that were just like us, living in some crazy times, living in uncertain times where they had a lot of questions about what exactly was going on. Peter is reminding the believers, just like us, that we have a hope. But what is the word that Peter uses to describe this hope? He says it is a living hope hope in verse 3. It's interesting that Peter used this word living hope. He put, he could have just said, we have a hope, and that would be true. Because with our faith in God, the King of kings and the Lord Lord of lords, we have a hope. But Peter didn't just call it a hope. Peter said that we have a living hope. And the reason that I believe Peter used the words living hope hope is because he is pointing us back to Jesus Christ. 
Because Peter, I believe here, is saying that Jesus is our living hope. He used the word living along with hope. And who was it that was living, and then he wasn't living, and then he was living again? It was Jesus Christ. And Peter is saying to the believers, if you want to rise above the circumstances of where you're at, then you can only do that in the living hope, which is Jesus. He finished the last part of verse 3 there. He said, he has given us new birth into a living hope, listen, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. He's pointing us all back to Jesus Christ. And listen, if you in this last year feel like you've got the wind knocked out of you, you feel like you've been knocked down and you're not certain that you're going to be able to get up again, here is the answer to the stuff that you've been going through. It is the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Here is the answer that you need, that the world needs, that we all need in order to face these silent Saturdays that we go through at times. We have a living hope. And in these moments of circumstances and the stuff and the silence that we go through, It's the same hope in today as it was on that first resurrection morning. It's the same hope that we have today that the the disciples discovered whenever they went into the tomb and it was completely empty. It is the living hope that every single one of us need. But yet there was still this quietness. And there was still this brokenness that the disciples had on that Easter Saturday where they weren't walking in a lot of hope. And they weren't walking in the victory that God had given to us, had given to them. I'm sure that they were questioning, where's God now? Remember all the people that had mocked them and all the people that had tried to get them to deny their actual, their, their faith? I'm sure that those questions begin to rise up, and I'm sure the enemy was bombarding them, saying, you can doubt it now because it's not real. He's dead, he's buried, and there is not a lot more final than death. And up until this point, they had no clue of what they were going to be experiencing in these things that Jesus had told them. The day before Easter, the day before Easter, God was at work. I can only begin to imagine as the Holy Spirit began to work inside that physical body that God came to wrap around him and began to bring these cells that did not have the oxygen and did not have the heart pumping to give them that oxygen, to keep them to life. I can only imagine the work that the Holy Spirit was doing in this corpse of Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, to be able to make the wiring of, of, of every bit of his body come back to life and raise him to defeat the consequences of sin. I can only begin to let my mind go for just a few moments, and then it just, uh, it just boggles your mind so much that you can't even begin to imagine it, to think about What the Holy Spirit was doing in that moment was the same thing that he was doing in the moment that he was knitting Jesus together inside of Mary's womb. And the Holy Spirit was celebrating the work that God had done to not only defeat sin, but to defeat the consequences, which was death. I can only begin to celebrate this living hope That God was knitting together again, despite the darkness, and despite the silence, and despite when it seems like God wasn't at work. So here's what I want you to take away from here today. Do you catch nothing else? This is what I want you to catch. Catch these few words. Don't give up on Jesus. I want, you to, I want to say them again because I want you to catch this. Don't give up on Jesus. 
Because even in the silence, he's working. Even in the quiet of an Easter Saturday, he's working. Even when it's behind the stone of a tomb, the Holy Spirit is at work. And it is all for his glory, and it is all for his honor. The same Jesus that appeared to the disciples on that first Easter morning is the same Jesus that is at work right here in 2021. Let me give you a couple of scriptures right quick. Romans chapter 8, verse 11. Here is the power of the living hope that we have. And if the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead, and here is where the Spirit is working on that quiet Easter Saturday. He's working to revive the body of Jesus. He could have done it in just a second, but He took a moment of quietness and stillness. The same Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you. There's your living hope. It's living in you. Then He who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who lives in you. Now think about that for just a moment. The same Holy Spirit who was at work in Jesus Christ, raising Him from the dead, is the same Spirit that lives inside of us. The power that brought Jesus' body back to life. The hope that raised to life is the same hope that lives inside of us. In Matthew 28, verse 20, this is after Jesus was resurrected. He's getting ready to go back to heaven, to ascend to His Father, and this is what Jesus says. And surely I will be with you always to the very end of the age. Jesus is with you. And if you don't give up on Jesus, it's in those moments of endurance, in those moments you will experience living hope because it's the same Jesus who is with you. It's the same Spirit that lives inside of each and every one of us. But do you ever worry that your quiet Saturdays, do you ever worry that those moments where it seems like God is not working, it's just too big for God? I, I don't know what it is that you carry. I don't know what it seems like weighs you down in your journey on earth. I don't know what it is for you that bogs you down in those quiet Easter Saturdays that we all go through. But here's what I do know. If you don't give up on Jesus, then you will discover the living hope because of his resurrection that you need to sustain you through everything that life throws at you. Because Jesus said, I will be with you always to the very, very end of the age, then we know that we're not alone. And we know that there is hope. And that hope is a living hope for every single one of us. Here's the amazing thing that Peter tells us about the resurrection. If you catch at the end of that section that I read, Peter says there's two people that have been searching for what we have. He said all of the prophets, all of the prophets of old, have been waiting, waiting for this moment that we have living hope. And then he says at the very, very end, even the angels in heaven long to look into these things, to long to look into the living hope that we actually have. The prophets and the angels are envy of us, envious of us. They want what we have, the living hope that comes through the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The prophets wanted it. They were awaiting Jesus, God, to come in the flesh as Jesus Christ, to give himself to defeat the enemy. He was wait, they were waiting for that. And even the angels longed to look into these things. And we have it. The living hope through the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's ours. As long as we don't give up in Jesus. Throughout this passage of Scripture, what we call the book of 1 Peter, 
you begin to see the excitement of Peter building as he talks about this. You see, he talks about praise be to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He talks about the joy that he actually has. And then he says, it's a joy that what some uh, songwriter or what some translations would say is a joy unspeakable and full of glory. Or here it's in this translation that I read, the New International Version, it says it's inexpressible and glorious joy. You go on and on and Peter talks about rejoicing. He talks about celebrating. He talks about being chosen. He talks about Christ being in us and the good that this is. You can feel the excitement that Peter has as he moves on. And that, for us, is the model that Peter has called us to. as an encouragement for this living hope that we have through the resurrection of Jesus Christ.